everyone, welcome uh, to this uh, session on gender. I hope you can hear me. Yes, that is the case. Uh, welcome also to the people, uh, the stakeholders who watch us through the live stream. Uh, very warm welcome to the session on gender. We have a new commission coming up, a new political leadership. We have a new framework program coming up, Horizon Europe. We are renewing the way we work, uh, co-designing, co-creating. So the objective of the session here uh, at this moment on gender is to really listen to you to see what we can do better for gender. Um, the title of this, gen of this session is Think Gender, Think Different. I would like to add that our ambition should be that when we leave this room in about one hour, we also act differently and not just think uh, differently. Um, the focus of our discussion here for the next hour is on gender in research and innovation content. Uh, the focus is not for this session, for this discussion on gender in careers, gender in decision-making panels, gender parity, equality in um, evaluation panels. All that is very relevant, very, very important. We take this very much to heart. But really, we would like to focus the discussion here on uh, gender, the aspect of gender in research and innovation content. I believe it's fair to say that at the European level, we have some good track record in trying to much bring, it, bring in the uh, gender dimension in the research and innovation content. I'm uh, quite proud to say, together with my colleagues in DG Research Innovation and other DGs in the Commission, that if you look at the last work program, the one of 2020, uh, for Horizon 2020, we can say that about 35% of all the topics have a gender dimension in it. Um, so this is just an illustration of how much we take this to heart. But of course, we can do better and we should do better. And that is why we are here uh, today. We know that 1.8% uh, only of all scientific publications in the European Union have a gender dimension explicitly. So there's still way to go uh, to improve on this. And that is exactly what we're now trying to do through the co-design on strategic planning so that we hear from you what we can do better, what we can do more, and how to do this. And I'm glad to announce that already um, for the input we received until the 9th of September, it's very clear that there is an overall big support to gender equality. Um, it very much corresponds to Sustainable Development Goal 5 uh, of the 17 SDGs. Um, and there is a general consensus and understanding that doing better on gender will also help us to maximize the scientific, the economic and societal impact of our investments. We have received about 200 open text comments and suggestions um, on the content of the orientation document, which we will take to heart. Um, and it's clear that in many of the clusters uh, that we have in the second pillar, the gender dimension can come out more strongly. For example, in the health cluster, it is clear that gender is relevant for all the health uh, challenges. And we hear the term coming up of gender medicine for example, that could be better reflected in uh, the strategic plan. In the cluster digital and industry, uh, what we see is that there is a lot of attention uh, that is asked for gender discriminatory technology, the gender bias and the development of artificial intelligence. Uh, if we develop robots um, and other kinds of tools, we want to make sure that there is no gender bias in it, uh, so that it is acceptable and valuable to everyone uh, in society. Um, and that actually corresponds very much to the ambition of our new president-elect, Mrs. van der Leyen, to come up with an ethically robust, world-leading regulation for artificial intelligence in the first 100 days of the next commission. A big challenge, I can tell you, to come up with such a, an initiative, groundbreaking uh, in the first 100 days. But also in the cluster climate, for example, um, we see that there is a lot of attention asked uh, for the behavioral aspects in climate change, where there is a very strong gender dimension. Um, I'm picking up myself, this is a very personal uh, comment, that most of the youngsters that are now leading the campaigns across the world with Greta Thunberg and others 
many of these are girls. Uh, so this whole campaign is actually led by girls, uh, mostly worldwide. Is this a signal of the time? I don't know. Maybe you can tell us. We will kick off the discussion with uh, two speakers uh, who have accepted uh, to be here with us today. Thank you very much. Matthias uh, Nilsson from the University of Copenhagen. Um, he is a member of our expert group on gendered innovations, um, which is helping us, the Commission, to develop evidence-based uh, methods and case studies to better position gender in research and innovation content. And this is an area on which Matthias has done work through his PhD, but also his research work at uh, Stanford University. And on my left-hand side, uh, Marcela Linkova uh, from the Czech Ad Academy of Sciences, uh, where Marcela directs the Center for Gender and uh, Science. Uh, Marcela has uh, co-edited in 2017 a book with I f what I find a very intriguing title, Gender and Neoliberalism in Czech Academia. Um, it gives me curiosity to have a look at uh, your book. Um, but very importantly, Marcela is also coordinator of the Gender Action project uh, that we support to Horizon 2020, with a, which is a policy network bringing together representatives from the member states on gender equality in research and innovation. Marcela is also chair of the ERAC uh, working group on gender in research and innovation. So let us maybe start with questions. Um, we will not have presentations as such, but I will go immediately to uh, Matthias with a first question, um, namely to ask, um, how do you see the orientations for the strategic planning and, and the survey outputs received so far address the um, ambition of better integrating gender in research and innovation content? Well, uh, that's a good question. Thanks for that. Um, first of all, I want to emphasize that the gender dimension cuts across all aspects of the research and innovation cycle. And I think the critical importance of this issue is also clear from the survey responses discussed uh, in relation to the, um, to the open consultation prior to this event. It's great to see this issue gaining momentum in Europe um, and gendered innovation welcomes the orientation documents focused on strengthening the gender dim uh, dimension across Horizon Europe. And we have some concrete input on how this can be done. And let me briefly go through a few examples from, from some of the clusters to give you some examples of the importance of this. Cluster one lists six health-related challenges, but gender aspects are only mentioned in one of these challenges, the challenge on staying healthy in a rapidly changing society. However, we see sex and gender analysis as relevant to all six of these challenges. And for instance, challenge three focuses on ensuring access to sustainable and high quality health care in Europe. And here we can highlight chronic pain as a concrete example. New research shows that neuroimmune pain responses differ by sex, and understanding pain signaling by sex can lead to new and more effective sex specific treatments in healthcare. And Gendered Innovations is currently developing a case study uh, in this area that will build on existing Horizon 2020 funded projects on pain. We also applaud Cluster 4 for seeking to integrate gender and other intersecting diversity issues into the design of research and innovation in its key prioritization of digitization. This cluster can also be strengthened by sex and gender analysis in areas such as artificial intelligence, social robotics, machine learning, and big data and virtual reality. And here I want to highlight face recognition as a concrete example. AI-based face recognition is increasingly used in policing, in uh, passport control, smart devices, uh, and the like, uh, but there's a lack of attention to tech intersections between gender and other social categories, which can weaken the accuracy of face recognition technologies. For instance, a recent research study shows that facial recognition systems misclassify gender more often for dark, darker-skinned women compared to light-skinned men. And building on insights from two Horizon 2020 projects, Gendered Innovations tries to develop now a case study in this area to demonstrate how an intersectional lens can improve the work on face recognition and AI. Energy 
uh, climate and, and mobility is, of course, also an important issue here, a critical issue in the, in the new program. And this is addressed in Cluster 5, and, and we want to highlight the critical importance also of thinking ca carefully about the gender dimension in this regard. Uh, consider, for instance, the increasing use of smart mobility options in urban transport systems. In short, this is a question of using ICT te technologies to improve mobility in cities while decarbonizing uh, the transport sector in Europe. And innovations in this field have, uh, until now, not devoted very much attention to the gender dimension. And this may limit uh, the uptake of smart mobility options and solutions in Europe. So the success of such solu solutions, we can say, it require that we take everyone's interests and preferences into account. So the gender dimension is very important here. And building on insights from, again, from existing Horizon 2020 projects, we're trying to develop a case study that will show how we can harness uh, sex and gender analysis to kind of improve and make more efficient and inclusive these approaches to mobility solutions. And let me then close off, uh, off by just saying that we see the integration of the gender dimension in Horizon Europe as a dynamic process that involves many different stakeholders. And we therefore also uh, recommend that the advisory group on gender is reinstated and that this group will draw across all the uh, European Commission sectors to provide experts expertise to provide trainings and to offer uh, ideas for the strategies for new framework programs and especially also in relation to the missions in uh, Horizon Europe. Um, second, we recommend that the European Commission monitor and evaluate its progress ongoingly with respect to the gender dimension in the new program. And by explicitly integrating sex and gender analysis into all of the six clusters in Pillars 2, we see, it, uh, we see that the Commission has a great opportunity to main, maintain its world-leading position in this area. So this is a great chance also for the Commission. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Very insightful comments which really illustrate the relevance and importance indeed of uh, gender integration. I will now turn to uh, Marcella with the same question. Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we also have Slido open, um, so you can also provide your suggestions, your comments via Slido, people here in the room or watching us live stream. And after Marcella's uh, comments, I will turn to the audience to ask you for your views, your comments, your suggestions. Marcella, please. Thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I will start with the uh, consultation. And uh, I have to say my view is a little more skeptical uh, of the results. Uh, because to me, it shows more than anything the continued lack of awareness of the importance of gender dimension in research. And I would even argue uh, continued uh, denial of the relevance of the research, gender research, that has been done in the past 30 plus years. And this really has to change. I think we have huge uh, space for improvement here. Um, what is troubling for me is that this denial also goes on in the scientific community. And I think that's unscientific. Um, you may have noticed that yesterday, and this may be one simple solution, Caroline Criado Perez got awarded the Royal Society uh, Science uh, Book Award for her book, Invisible Women. And so maybe everyone who's thinking about applying for uh, EU funding for research should just buy the book and read it. Because if this does not persuade you, I don't know what will. But going to um, the orientations document. Um, Matthias has already mentioned uh, Cluster One Health, uh, which, which is really uh, striking to me that uh, gender was mentioned only in one out of the six. By now, I would have thought that uh, we really have uh, agreement on the fact that sex and gender analysis is really necessary in all medical research. We cannot study bodies without attending to this. Um, with Cluster 2, I want to mention one very important aspect that appears there, which is uh, intersectionality. Uh, it mentions intersections between gender and other social categories in the social and economic transformations area of intervention. But as with gender as such, I think we need to apply intersectionality in all the areas of intervention, not only in Cluster 2, but we need to take it to the other clusters, because take, for example, climate, health again. I mean, we need to be looking at socioeconomic uh, status, we need to be looking at age, but also other uh, uh, 
axes of inequality such as race, ethnicity, and others, uh, migration, uh, mobility, all of these areas of research. So we need to pay attention to intersectionality all across uh, the, the program. And then for cluster four, digital industry and space, gender is mentioned only in one out of the three policy objectives. And we have already heard uh, there are multiple problems. Uh, we know that there is uh, racial and sexist bias in artificial intelligence, uh, big data, uh, and all of these. Um, one thing is voice recognition. I mean, Google, Google voice recognition is 70% more likely to understand men than women. And I think that it's really the time for women to stop hearing, just lower your voice and then our cars will listen to us, <laughs> right? I mean, we need to design technologies that actually work for women. Um, and then cluster five, climate, uh, energy and mobility. This cluster now fails to mention gender completely. Although climate change drivers, impacts, mitigation solutions, uh, adaptation patterns are all gendered, there are differences between women's and men's energy needs, consumption patterns. Uh, we also know that women and men perceive in some countries the climate crisis differently, with women seeing it as a greater risk. So this is something uh, very important to keep in mind. Another thing we have recently learned that our offices are too cold for women, which is not only uncomfortable for us, but recent German study discovered that we also work cognitively worse in cold situations, when we feel cold. So this would be good for environment and this would be good for our ability to deliver the best that we can uh, when we think uh, uh, properly. So I think that there are huge opportunities for improvement and uh, I think that it's, it's really vital to also um, address um, gender in the innovation pillar three where it is not mentioned at all. Thank you very much, uh, Marcela. Um, we've heard some very good examples that illustrate why the gender dimension is so relevant, so important. But there seems to be a lack of awareness, and that is also reflected, it is felt, in our orientations document uh, for strategic planning. Over to you uh, in the audience. Um, do you share this analysis? What could we do better? Uh, where should we give priority attention? Um, and I'll go around with the microphone. Monica, please. If you briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Monica Ibafan. Yeah, works. My name is Monica Ibafan with the Global Water Partnership. And uh, I'm here also to talk um, a lot with the colleagues around the climate adaptation agenda, which is where water plays uh, a major role. I'm not surprised by your findings. I uh, wanted to confirm them also. The water sector uh, is um, completely devoid of women in any decision-making structures. Um, we also have some research that we could share for you on this one. Um, a suggestion, um, in our gender strategy, we have divided um, the areas that one can do in order to encourage action um, uh, that is gendered um, by taking a look at is there awareness but also are there targets and so I wanted to see and encourage whether going forward under the Horizon uh, Europe work one could possibly link not only a question on awareness but also a question on targets and where I'm coming from here is you've looked at uh, women as clients, if you will, of the research that's being done, or women as victims, but not so much as women as decision makers. And that is a dimension that when you set targets, oftentimes gets lost. So if you were to require certain things again along targets, you could actually structure it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Um, anyone else? Uh, yes, please, sir. Thank you. Um, Philip de of Yellow Window. Um, I don't know if your reference to the consultation was specific, but in the in the web survey, unless I've missed something, I was not able to indicate my gender. So I wonder whether there's gender-specific analysis even possible on the consultation. Okay, good point. I we will have to check this. Um, anyone else? Yes, please, Margarita. Good morning, I'm Margrethe Frey from the Belgian Science Policy Office. 
Uh, Horizon Europe is, of course, the main um, tool that we have for research and innovation at European level. But there are also other programs that are related to research, like Digital Europe. When I look at Digital Europe, and I invite you to do the same, I don't see gender in this program. <laughs> Well, we all know that uh, the relationship between women and the digital uh, society, all the digital uh, technologies, still has to be improved. So um, it seems t uh, that we also have a problem of awareness inside the European Commission. So my question is, what is the European Commission uh, planning to do in order to solve this problem inside, so not only within Horizon Europe? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're not here to promote our actions. We're here to listen to you, to your input, to your expectations, and learn from you what you want. Uh, please. Uh, thank you. Anna Pui from the Spanish Ministry of Science, Innovation and, and Universities. Thank you so much to both the speakers and to the Commission for organizing this, this session. Uh, what I would like to raise now is that, OK, we, I think we all here agree that it is very important uh, to push more for gender as a cross-cutting issue in all clusters, and it should be a default uh, in any any project. There are very, very, really few exceptions on pure mathematics uh, analysis. Mathematical analysis could be uh, away from this, but I would also raise the issue uh, on gender-specific projects. On gender-specific projects, those who are really focused on on trying to, to tackle the, the SDG 5. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's not only what all the other clusters uh, can be benefited from a gender analysis for their excellence and their impact, but it is also that the Commission also has to put uh, funds and attention to on research and innovation who trying to, to, to really uh, obtain uh, or attain the, the, the uh, targets in SDG 5. I mean, against gender-based violence, and against women's and girls' empowerment, and all the other clusters can also work for this. It's not only gender for the other clusters. Thank you very much. There was a question here. Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Marta Agustino, EU Life Alliance. Uh, regarding the, the denial problem, which is uh, related to awareness, uh, first of all, it is really mandatory, and, and thanks to the European Commission, that through the Horizon Europe, gender um, is really uh, considered still a priority because we risk like of tiring people of always talking about these things, uh, and sometimes we have this problem. So it's really important that from top, this is kept as a priority. One thing that. Um, our biases will never disappear, I mean, biases do not disappear. What we need to ensure is that we have the systems in place and the organizations are strong enough to uh, avoid that these biases uh, lead uh, the, the decisions. So one thing that we, we really would like to see in Horizon Europe is a continued support to institutional change in gender and diversity. It was before in 12s, but now uh, across the world program. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take two more questions and then turn back to our speakers for any reactions you may have. There's a lady there. Hi, good morning. I'm Martina Hartl from the Austrian Ministry of Education, Science and Research. And I think one of the things that the Commission could still do is um, when you talk about open to the world, when you do your association agreements and when you do your bilateral corporations and your s and agreements, I think there is still room for improvement in, in giving gender a more prominent role, also to signal to all those third countries that this is a topic that you find important, that we find important, that in the relations we find it important that um, research in that area is also promoted. That would be one of the things I think that could still be done. Thank you, Martina. Very much linked also to the question of on SDG 5, indeed. Huh? Um, very good point. Uh, yes, please. Hi, I'm Beth Thompson from the Wellcome Trust. I've, picked, I've taken really two main things from the panelists' comments. First, that there's not enough profile given to this issue and the problem of denial, but also the question of intersectionality and other minoritized groups. And I'm really interested in the views from you and from the room about whether the best solution is therefore to focus on gender and try and raise the profile of that, or do we have to do everything together and consider gender and other issues of minoritized groups together? So I, I love the fact you have a specific recommendation um, on the gender um, working group, 
But should that be broader? Would you cover everything in that, or do we have to keep them separate? Thank you very much. Uh, really very good comments, I find. Uh, question on targets, um, question on other programs. Can Horizon Europe teach something to other programs and policies in the Commission? The international dimension. Should gender be separately treated or together with other issues of bias, uh, diversity? Um, Marcela, can I first turn to you and then to Matthias? Okay. So, uh, one recommendation would definitely be to take an intersectional approach, uh, but highlighting gender. Uh, but I think that also for the structural change projects, uh, the Commission, I hope indeed that it continues funding them and that they will address uh, gender in an intersectional uh, way as well. Uh, I, I think that we have seen in the past that unless gender continues to be on the agenda, it slips through the cracks. Other things become more important. That's why I think that we must not lose uh, the attention uh, to gender. Thank you. Uh, Matthias? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree to that point. I think we should think instead perhaps that gender is a kind of leverage here to focus more attention to the other points and therefore we need to keep that in focus as well. And as regard many of the other comments, I think they're all uh, excellent examples of, of this being kind of a a holistic issues. We need to think about how the, the institutions can become better at taking these issues into account. We need to also think about the representation of women in decision-making roles, as this may play a role in, uh, as well in terms of thinking about gender diversity and the gender dimension in content. And then I also think it's important to, to, to think about here that the European Commission can be a flagship, flagship institution in teaching other uh, granting agencies, for instance, what to do. But they can also still learn from other agencies. They can learn from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, as, 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 as I shall return to in a minute. They have training programs that teach researchers to work systematically with these issues. And I think it would be important for the Commission to support similar approaches to educate researchers and applicants for the programs in how to work with the gender dimension in their projects. Yeah. I would like to just echo what Matthias is saying. I think that the uh, Commission in the past has played the, you know, has been the beacon for European values, including gender equality. And I think that now we find ourselves at a time in history when this must continue across EU from the Commission. And I think that this, th this is not only for Horizon Europe, but also for the other portfolios. Yes, and that's a clear expectation we hear, we pick up. Um, it's also linked to the comment that was made about institutional change uh, uh, that needs to accompany all the work program drafting we will do on the content on uh, research innovation. Turning back to research innovation content, um, Matthias, you already mentioned a few uh, methodological aspects. Are there a few silver bullet methodologies that you could recommend to us? Well, uh, we're in the progress of we're in the front, thank you. Uh, the, the slides, I think they need to, to be turned back on. I'll just continue uh, talking. Much progress has been made since gendered innovation started out in 2012, working on these issues. Methods for sex and gender analysis, I think, are becoming more sophisticated and domain specific. And the Commission has been a global leader in pushing this agenda forward. But we need to keep the pace, I think, and we need to think carefully about how the gender dimension fits in with all of the six clusters. And this should be more explicit, of course. And in gendered innovations, we will deliver case studies, methodologies, checklists, and resources to guide the activities of the various clusters in Horizon Europe. And we have, a new, case, we have new case studies and discipline-specific methods coming up in five areas. And these are the five areas that are listed here. And a key task for us will be to update existing methods according to the latest theoretical insights on sex and gender. And the development of more discipline-specific methods uh, are, is also an important uh, aspect here. Here, uh, specialized research and, uh, and innovation fields also need specialized methods for sex and gender. We, we cannot just provide a generic framework for this because the questions related to sex and gender vary across disciplines and areas. 
Moreover, our new methods will focus greater, greater attention, of course, to the question of how gender intersect with all the social categories. And this is in accordance with what's mentioned in the cluster two that we've been already been talking about. And we see intersectionality as an extremely critical factor in fostering more inclusive research and innovation activities that are sensitive to the needs and, and, and expectations of all citizens in Europe. Finally, the updated methods will offer more detailed accounts of the many different steps in the research and innovation process, where sex and gender may play a role. That could be from the initial uh, considerations of problem choice in the research process to the development of methodological design, data collection, and reporting of results. And similar, if we think about an innovation cycle, we can think about specific issues related to gender and sex in many of these steps, and we need to become better at reflecting on the importance of sex and gender at each step. Another key task will be to strengthen the link between policy and praxis with respect to the gender dimension in the work of the Commission. In the Gender Innovation Innovations Group, we will develop concrete uh, recommendations on how to best integrate the gender dimension in Horizon Europe. And first of all, we think it will be critical that applicants for the Horizon Europe program are provided with informative instructions on how to meaningfully integrate gender dimensions into their proposals. And second, key points on the gender dimension should be included in the briefing materials for evaluators. And these should be tailored also to the specific disciplines in which these uh, evaluators are embedded. Third, and this is very important, uh, when relevant, the gender dimension should be reflected in the evaluation criteria used to assess proposals for Horizon Europe. If we want to change also applicants' behavior and raise awareness of this, it's a very efficient strategy, I think, to start trying to include the gender dimension in the evaluation criteria. Fourth, we suggest that the European Commission, as already mentioned, could offer workshops and trainings on the gender dimension. And as mentioned, the US National Institutes of Health and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research already offer seven online courses on sex and gender analysis. And, and the European Commission could strengthen, strengthen its in implementation of the gender dimension, I think, also by starting to develop online courses, for instance, for uh, engineers, for environmental researchers, AI researchers, and so on, to increase awareness. Finally, I want to say that as more granting agencies work to integrate sex and gender analysis into research and innovation, we also advise the Commission to network with these experts from the different countries. As of January 2020, the German Research Foundation, the French National Research Agency and the Austrian Science Fund will all require sex and gender analysis in their research proposals for their funding agencies. And we encourage close interactions with these different uh, groups. Um, through tailored briefing materials, through updated evaluation criteria and more targeted training, I think that uh, Horizon Europe can contribute to show the way for many other granting agencies in, in, in Europe and across the globe. So, so those are my points here. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Ladies and gentlemen, like this, you know what advice the European Commission is getting, uh, will be getting. Um, does that uh, raise any comments uh, from you, any support, any perplexity or emotions? Uh, I'll turn to the lady here. Th Thank you very much. I just want to simply share with you what we're doing here at the Irish Research Council. So my name's Jane Olmar, I'm chair of the Irish Research Council. So five years ago, we introduced the uh, blind evaluation of uh, proposals. And on the foot of that, we saw the proportion of uh, women uh, increase uh, uh, by a third in STEM subjects and by a fifth in AHSS, Arts, Humanities, Social Science subjects. That is telling me that there was a bias. Uh, of, of, of obviously, you hope unconscious. We've also been doing a lot of training of our evaluators. Um, and the other thing is every single question, I mean, every single application you have to answer the question, is gender relevant to your proposal? And if it is, you have to explain why. But if it's not, you have to explain why. And, and what we're finding is it has actually made a, a, a material difference on the ground. And we have now data uh, uh, that's five, six years old that we'd be very happy to share if it would be a, a, of any value or use. So thank you for this. That would be lovely. Thank you. Yes, please. We would love to have uh, those data and the results of this analysis. Always very valuable. Uh, there were some other hands raised uh, in the room. Anyone else who wants to come in? No. Um, ah, here. 
Thank you very much. Viviane Wallace maseki I was the former head of sector for gender in the G Research and Innovation. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased in a way uh, to see that uh, there are more men involved <laughs> because when we started, there were many uh, only women. So that's great. Uh, and uh, I would fully back what Matthias suggested. But I would add other elements. Uh, like the recognition, the recognition of gender expertise in universities. Because when we did the um, halfway uh, evaluation of Horizon 2020, we noticed that even in projects where there was a, a good attempt of developing a gender dimension, there was no gender expert, or at least they were hidden. So this is really important that universities acknowledge that developing a gender dimension needs a specific expertise, specific skills, and that these experts are involved in projects. So that's this situation. Thank you, Vivian. Um, it's important indeed that we take a science-based approach uh, to this uh, policy, um, and that it is not just across the board tick box ticking exercise, yeah. uh, which would give us a good feeling, but wouldn't change anything uh, in practice. I would also like to add that we're discussing gender, but there are many other rooms where other aspects and dimensions are also discussed, like societal outreach, like widening aspects in the European research area, like contribution to climate change, like participation of small and medium-sized enterprises, and I can go on and on. And everyone is asking to have this reflected in the evaluation criteria, in the briefings to proposers, etc., uh, etc. Et so how do we make sure that the gender dimension is there and really understood as something that will make a difference for science, for society and economy, without being an undue burden on the researchers and the actors in the research field. Um, this is just a question I would like to throw up. Anyone else in the room who would want to come in? Um, I'll go first to the lady in the back and then back to you, Monica. <laughs> Yes, hello. Uh, I have uh, more of a comment. I mean, I don't want to be uh, mean, but uh, okay. It, this is all very interesting. This is like this. Uh, this is a great initiative. Now there's a, there's also a thing now for women and for minority groups in general that is spreading among society. Is more uh, consideration of of dominations, like even in the in the border like uh, in the border point of view of uh, fields of domination. But this never appeared like in the European uh, uh, Commission perspective. And like, I mean, women start to be kind of angry and also they, how to say that, like, uh, I'm stressed. And uh, no, like they start to be more like they focus more on each other, like uh, on themselves, like they are, like things are not mixed anymore. So maybe like uh, the European Commission can maybe take that into consideration because like uh, the domination, uh, like uh, the, uh, like the domination speaks, go back, like go back really into society. So maybe it could be time. I don't know. Thank you. Um, very insightful comment. How do we make sure that gender inequality does not become gender opposition? and that we do not uh, lead to situations where we forget or ignore other issues of bias uh, in our society. Monica? I just want a simple suggestion. Um, you asked what can be asked to the researchers uh, beyond studying it. Um, very simple principle, um, never about them when without them. Just think about what it means. Never about them when without them. Super simple principle, can be applied in all research. We take note of this. Um, my colleagues will certainly write this down and we'll refer to reflect on this. Uh, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, Sarah, University of Ljubljana. I have a question, completely practical. I, as a researcher, what's, what's um, have been done on social security of female researchers? On the end of the day, like, is it based on national legislation or because most of the research programs are financed for two, three years, and what happens with female researchers, for example, in case of maternity leaves? 
like the safety or si social safety or uh, uh, professional safety and so on. Is it anything done in this question? Yes, we are having a few measures in place, for example, in the European Research Council, where we have special provisions for women on maternity leave. Also in the Marie Skrudowska Curie actions, we will have special provisions. We're taking care of this. Whether it's enough is another question. Uh, whether we should do more, that is uh, certainly a worthwhile question. Um, shall I turn back to the speakers to see if you have any reaction to what you heard? Well, uh, it's, it's really great that uh, okay, if I can have my slide on. Uh, it's, it's really great to see that there is so much consensus. Uh, I pretty much have very similar recommendations to what Matthias presented, uh, some of which you have also been mentioning. From Gender Action, our basic position is that the integration of gender dimension in Horizon Europe needs to be the default. If you don't do it, you have to explain why you don't do it. There are some areas of research and there are very few where this is not relevant. In all the others, you need to explain how you tackle it. And if you don't, and it is relevant, you should fail the threshold criteria for excellence. Uh, gender also needs to be addressed in impact. And you need to e explain how your research and how your innovat innovative solutions will impact women and men differently, if they will, and what you're taking, uh, doing to take care of this. Um, clearly, it needs to be part of the evaluation, so evaluation uh, reports and evaluation summary reports uh, should, should address this uh, very clearly in both the excellence and impact, but also, and this has been also mentioned, including gender expertise in your consortia uh, needs to be ad addressed in the quality and efficiency of the implementation. So making sure that you have the know-how, you have the competences to actually do this. And then uh, uh, the briefings for evaluators. I mean, we know from past experience this has not always been ideal. Uh, gender briefings need to be properly done. Matthias has uh, suggested how. And uh, what is important, this must not concern only the research and innovation actions but it needs to address also and be applied in missions and partnerships. Thank you, Marcela. Uh, very much aligned with what uh, Matthias was saying. Matthias, anything to add uh, from your perspective? Um, well, I, th I think she, she captures pretty, pretty well my, my points here also. Uh, it, it's just extremely important that there is some kind of, what, what could we say, um, that, that, that the things written into the policies here are also reflected in how the program is implemented. And that is, the criteria is so extremely important for making researchers taking this into account. So this would be an easy way for the Commission also to start to promote this, I think. Very much understood. Um, but is gender then so much more important than other societal objectives? Uh, we've heard a few, there are others as well. Eh? So should gender be really more important than other aspects like societal outreach, like inclusiveness, like other forms of bias? Or can gender be a trailblazer for other issues, other uh, expectations and ambitions in society? I do not have a personal opinion myself. I just want to throw the question to you. Is there anyone, is there in the Slido um, something that uh, we could report? Cyril, please. Yep. Yes, it works. Thank you, Kurt. Yes, we've had uh, 11 uh, contributions so far, so quite a lot of, uh, of interesting uh, contributions uh, on Slido. For example, a lot uh, concur on the importance of evaluation, evaluation briefings, evaluation criteria, etc. But also importance of targets uh, for female uh, representation, topics also in Horizon Europe, importance of women in leading roles uh, in research and innovation, uh, some also uh, ask for um, the gender to definitely remain a priority of the European research area. Uh, education is mentioned as an important uh, topic, education in early life about gender uh, issues. Um, Again, also the fact that the gender dimension could be uh, uh, or should be a topic for research by itself. 
um, the gender dimension of climate change, the question of the flagging uh, in Horizon Europe, and finally, the fact that we should not mix gender and sex. These are two different concepts, and we're talking here about gender. So a lot of uh, very interesting comments also on Slido. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. And as said by some of you, the Commission is really a beacon for gender equality and in introducing, integrating gender in research innovation content. We want to continue taking that leadership with your support, with your help, with your advice, and with the awareness spreading among the scientific uh, community. Can I turn back to the audience and see if there is any other comment, question? Um, yes, please. Hi, yes, um, Sheila Heymans from the European Marine Board. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right place, but I'm going to say it anyway. So some of the, co uh, some of the um, suggestions that Marcella made, um, that we should include females in, or, or gender into the evaluation, and a lot of these, these um, suggestions that we should have um, the same amount of, you know, you should, you should have the right amount of, of males and females in, in any of your evaluations or in the proposals or in the projects, it's all good and well, but it comes back to the social security question. I think if you don't address the fact that uh, females don't have the same rights at work level, you're not going to have the right amount of females to actually um, be on the evaluation panels. And so the few that are there end up running around like headless chickens and not getting to their science because they're, all they're doing is the evaluations. So there's a much more systemic problem that we need to address, and I'm not sure if this is the place to address it, but we should definitely highlight that it's there. This is definitely the, the place to raise it. And I can assure everyone that on targets for evaluation panels, decision-making bodies, the Commission will continue uh, with its leadership uh, position in this and approach. And this will not go wasted or lost at all. Quite to the contrary, we want to do even better. But it's true that we need to link it up with a more systemic agenda. Uh, there's, yes, please, there's a gentleman here. Hello, I'm uh, Tobias Ström from the Research Council of Norway. I used to work on the integration of SSH in the European Commission for three years. Uh, I want to pick up a little bit on the kind of complexity of cross-cutting issues because there's no doubt that uh, there are so many of them, I think 14 in the legal basis, and it reflects on the, how the organization is in RTD. And my experience was a little bit that when you are writing a topic in some kind of cluster or societal challenge, then one day you get the SSH people coming, the other day international cooperation, and the third day the gender people. And they all have their positive ambitions, but there's no doubt that they can talk more to each other and uh, agree on a common strategy. And I think the, the new setup of DG Research and Innovation will help to do actually that. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, that's exactly the day-to-day -day situation that colleagues uh, face. I'll turn to Carmen Villa, who had a very leading political position in the Spanish government. Is it Carmen? Thank you. I was. I was former state secretary for research, development and innovation in Spain. I, I apologize because I arrived just a little bit late. I don't know if you mentioned, I think that is important issue, the mission. The mission is the new deliverable for Horizon Europe. And the five mission, by now, from the quantitative point of view, the board are quite paritary. But it's more important, which is the quality of the research. So I think that I ask the commission to emphasize the chair of the mission to raise this issue. I, I am sitting in one of these board, and definitely I will rise. This morning in the cancer mission was already commented, but the climatic change, the ocean, and everything need to be addressed. And I have a comment, I don't know if I can... Please, so please. The practical question that our colleague has been developed regarding research and women on research. Uh, in Spain, and I know many countries in Europe, if you apply the charter and code of the researchers, that means that all the grants become a contract. If you have a contract, the researchers and anybody will need to fulfill the social security system that you have in your country. And on top of that, in the call, I think that we, ha we have in Spain, as you mentioned, the Marie Curie, we have been applied the ERC concept, and it's very easy to do it. Probably the Commission can try to help, and if not, to make some strong recommendation to the structural fund taking care of that. Sometimes it's worth it to make this issue. 
Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for reminding us of the missions, which indeed are aiming at societal transformation, so the gender dimension must be there. And we're working a lot on synergies of programs uh, at European level between Horizon Europe, Digital Europe, Structural Funds and many other programs. So maybe there's scope there for better reflecting uh, the gender dimension, which could also help in improving the systemic uh, situation or uh, the systemic conditions for women to participate better in research. Um, I think it's also going to be an important point of attention when we revitalize the European research area so that we have this discussion with the member states because many of these obstacles and barriers are of course in the hands of national competences. Uh, yes, please. Hi, thank you, uh, Lisa Almesjö from uh, the Swedish Innovation Fund there, Vinova, and also Brussels office. Uh, I think very interesting discussions and very many good points. I would just like to mention also that the gender dimension is not only about uh, including uh, people in boards and so on. It's also, if we do not include it, uh, we will have uh, solutions new technical solutions or, or products developed not for entire uh, society, which is a, a economic stupidity and, and prosperous st stupidity. So for that reason, I think it should really be uh, ma ma mainstreamed. Thank you. Exactly so. Um, we aim at better, m more impactful, more relevant science and innovation. And uh, gender plays a very important role in this. Yes, please, madam. Yes, I would like to say something about, because you were asking before, should, we, should gender be the leading force? Should we forget about social outreach? I think it's a mistake to look at these things in an isolated fashion, because they're all connected. They do not exist by themselves. And gender, for instance, is part is a dimension of social outreach, it is a dimension mm. of sustainability. Exactly. So um, your question, I think, in itself is not the correct one. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is exactly the kind of input we need, and uh, we will need to work on that indeed. Um, anyone else? There was a gentleman there who wanted to come back. Yes, sorry. I actually just wanted to second that. I wanted to respond to your question whether gender is a trailblazer. Um, I don't think we're talking about a minority here. We're talking about half of the half of the population at least, um, and I do think it can be a trailblazer. And you said I have no personal opinion on that. I would want to ask you to get a personal opinion on that <laughs> because you are a very important influencer on that. <laughs> Well, when I say I don't have a personal opinion, it's as in my capacity as moderator of this session. Mm. We are here today to listen to you, not to defend the Commission's policy or activities. That's the instruction for uh, the sessions here during the RNI days. Um, I'll turn back to the speakers to see if there's any other reflection you want to add. Uh, Marcella? Well, what, what I would like to address is what we can do together in Europe. Uh, as I said, I think the Commission needs to continue its role as, as the beacon uh, and uh, be very strong, uh, deliver more strongly in Horizon Europe. What I have seen is that the policy coordination at the EU level really plays a huge role and the European research area ha has been a really great instrument. Uh, in the standing working group, we did an analysis of the Council conclusions uh, and uh, implementation on gender equality in ERA. And the national action plans and strategies were very often the first policy document to be adopted in the newer member states. Granted, the actions were not always the most ambitious you could imagine, but it was a start. So the ERA and the national action plans and strategies played a huge role. And if I could have my slides back, please. Uh, so that's, that's one I think that, uh, that we need to keep in mind. The second, I have to say that from uh, my personal experience uh, in the former Helsinki group on women in science, then gender in science, and now in the standing working group, you know, policy exchange and coordination among the member states and research funding organizations has been vital, especially for the countries that are less active. Uh, we can always use the examples from the countries back home, and, and it's really vital. So I think that for the next iteration of ERA, 
I would really suggest that it's important to maintain a policy platform where the Commission and member states and associated countries can exchange and what they are doing, what works, but very importantly also what does not work, because we sometimes have really bad experience uh, and, and we need to learn from that bad experience uh, as well. Um, and one other thing is we can see, and we will be publishing a, a report in Gender Action soon, where we are looking at various uh, gender equality indicators and innovation and research excellence innovators. There are correlations. Higher innovators are doing more for gender equality. We need to ask why. They are also scoring better on gender equality. And so the widening gap the widening funding that has been in uh, Horizon 2020 and will continue in Horizon uh, Europe needs to tackle this. The widening gap needs to be bridged, not only in the research and innovation comp competences, but also in gender equality. We can't have this sort of dual Europe where some countries are doing a lot and some countries are not doing almost, uh, almost anything. And this gets me to what was said about the research conditions, because this is really bad for the researchers. We are building European research area. We are uh, sending researchers on fellowship postdocs across Europe. And we can guarantee equal pay. We can guarantee safety, sexual harassment policies, gender-based violence. We can uh, guarantee work-life balance issues. And we can not guarantee such elementary things as uh, transparency in how institutions operate, or even HR. This is ridiculous. And this gets us back to uh, the, the, the knowledge production. Uh, because, as was said, if we don't have the women in, then very often we cannot identify the things that are relevant to women's lives and that need to be studied. Hence the, the data gaps that we have. So this is, this is very uh, important. Uh, interconnection. And one last thing that I want to mention is backlash and attacks on gender scholarship. Okay. This is very serious. And I think that we need more than ever uh, very explicit policy support for gender scholarship and gender research. Policymakers have today responsibility for sticking up for gender research and explain the benefits, not only in terms of SDG 5, but also in the, all the other areas. Um, Gender scholars are today threatened with very real and virtual violence and attacks. And so, this is an attack on academic freedom. We cannot tolerate this in Europe. And one way to counter this is to allocate proper funding for gender-focused research in Horizon Europe. Horizon Europe needs to send a strong message that censorship and violence have no place in research, and from my perspective, this is really about increasing public trust in research. Because if we have properly funded gender scholarship and we fill the data gaps, we increase the trust of all people in research because women are getting the solutions that they need and men get the solutions that they need. We get the health treatments that we, that we need, etc. So it's, it's a complex issue, we can do better, and we need gender scholarship, gender research, and the Commission should say this very clearly. Thank you, Marcela. I think these are very important points that resonate very much, I think, with this audience and also with the colleagues in the Commission, uh, DG Research and other services. I can assure you of this. Matthias, anything you want to add at this point? Well, um, two things. First of all, to your question of can we, can we, should it be a, a, like a priority or something that goes with other things? I, th I think we should prioritize all of the issues you mentioned because that, I think that's what the purpose of the, of the Horizon Euro program is. So the societal aspect should all be emphasized. But we speak also from an experience of gender being something that's a little bit challenged as a priority sometimes. So in that sense, we're here representing the importance of that and s speaking into a discussion of why that's important to re-emphasize and focus attention to it. But of course, all of these issues are important and I see them all as relevant for the criteria in the evaluation of, of proposals. And the second point here I think is important that I, I completely agree with the point that uh, while we focus here on the gender dimension, it's of course linked to the broader discussion 
discussion on gender inequalities in, in, in research institutions in Europe and in the rest of the world, these, these things are closely related. And also the underrepresentation of women in, in certain fields and at decision-making levels has implications, of course, for the questions raised, for the methods, methods employed in research. And this is therefore not only a question of justice within the academic system, it's a question of social justice uh, in bro broader society and about having different perspectives on the world. And that's extremely important. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting to the end of this uh, session. It's already uh, one hour that we're discussing this. I think we'll learn a lot. Um, and there's no doubt that gender remains a priority in the future. The Commission will want to do and will have to do better. And I think we got some very good suggestions here during this session. We, had, we thought we would do a little poll. I don't know if that is still uh, possible. I can't see with all the lights. No? <laughs> OK. No, Paul. Uh, we'll do that the next time. Um, unless anyone wants to shout a last comment, uh, something you really want to say at this point, uh, very brief, Twitter-like. Twitter-like. I, I forgot to mention before that uh, the specific mission uh, on gender or specific partnership of gender for the second stage of Horizon Europe would be great to support all these uh, gender-specific studies and to address in better the, the SDG 5. I think missions also in their portfolio approach can also help uh, all the projects uh, included to in better introduce gender, but we also need the specific research on the gender issues. Thank you. Thank you. We leave that with us for reflection and discussion. Thank you. Last uh, comment? Really tweet, uh, tweet short. <laughs> Uh, we should also combat uh, unconscious bias. This hasn't been really mentioned today because uh, if we educate on gender issues, I think uh, we could come further. Uh, yes. Thank you very much indeed, a very good point. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here, for participating in the discussion. Thank you to our speakers, uh, Marcela and Matthias. And thank you to the colleagues in DG Research who have organized uh, this session, Mina, Anne and Cyril and others. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope you enjoy the RNI days. It's not finished yet. There are still plenty of sessions. Please join them. We need you. Thank you.